called in to study his early campaigns. In those campaigns, he never mispronounced the word. He spoke in com syntactically complete sentences. He argued in classical debating form. Karen Hughes says he corrects her speeches to make them fit classical debating form, which he learned at Yale, studying with the same uh, teacher as John Kerry. And what you find in the study of when he messes up in his speech it's whenever he tries to talk about empathy and compassion, not when he's talking about the war. Right? He is not dumb. He is not inarticulate in general. He is smart. And when he talks about victory in Iraq, think about oil. That is, you know, the, we, Alan Greenspan got it right. Right now, the question about contracts, you know, for the distribution of oil contracts in Iraq, the main issue there is will American oil companies get exclusive 30-year contracts where they will get 75% of the profits for uh, over 30 years to you know, build the infrastructure. If they get those, those are going to become our, quote, vital interests in Iraq, and, we're not, and, and the people who want to keep troops there are to protect our vital interests, namely the people, like Halliburton, building all those oil facilities. That is part. When people say they're going to bring home our combat troops, they're not saying all of our troops, and they're not saying we're going to get rid of those oil contracts. They're not doing that at oil. 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 Um, Drew, last word, and then we'll go to questions, if you have a last word. Just a, a quick word is that uh, I don't know of the evidence of, of um, who's read what. I, I do know that Karl Rove put together a council of academic advisors who had access to... Uh, who did? Uh, Karl Rove did, who had access to all the published material on, uh, on implicit versus explicit racism, for example. And the, the ad put out by the RNC, we don't have time to queue it up, but... Um, that was uh, run by um, uh, for, for um, uh, Bob Corker against Harold Ford Jr. Um, it is difficult for me to imagine that someone did that with just incredibly good intuitive sense of how to run, uh, how to create that ad. I, uh, it included uh, subliminal elements and functionally subliminal elements that I think you'd have to, I think you'd probably have to know that literature to do. Although, you know, just going back. Um, uh, Ronald Reagan did know how to activate, um, uh, activate conscious feelings that were stronger because of the unconscious um, implicit racial issues below, like by saying things like able-bodied able welfare loafers or welfare queens that immediately activated this person's black. Or the Willie Horton ad was an example uh, that was used by George H.W. Bush. Actually, in response to that, twice as many people heard about the ad than actually saw it. But the, again, this is where, where people got overactive, they got angry. If they just let the ad run, run its course, it would not have done the damage. The Democrats started yelling and screaming about the ad, and it caused people in Tennessee to look at it and go, oh, wow, I didn't know that. There are times, like right now, when it is better to be silent than it is to speak up. And be uh, and and draw attention to a particular issue. Andres, questions. All right. Thank you. Um, wonderful. Uh, we've been given permission to go about ten minutes over, and it's a good thing because if these cards are a kind of virtual poll, uh, this has been a very successful panel indeed. But uh, the first card I just can't resist reading because after a day spent listening to opportunistic, nefarious, focus group, test marketed, evil propaganda, it's sometimes really nice to hear something that's very honest in a way that I think only a young person can be. We are joined by many students here today and I suspect that this is from one of them and it's a compliment to the panel. It is really a great experience to be here and to listen to incredible speakers. I love the way the topic of propaganda has been discussed. I'm going with a clearer idea of the meaning of propaganda and how it spreads. I have learned a lot. So, I think we've achieved our purpose. We are in a public library, and this is why we're here. The second interesting thing about my comments, and I don't know, Frank, what kind of frames you've activated, but about, and I don't know what relationship you have to Procter & Gamble, but about 95% of the cards uh, uh, refer to you. So I don't think New York hates you. New York loves you. They all want to ask you questions, and here's one of them. Mr. Lunds. You know, you guys are all like my mom, basically. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have cheesecakes. Here's one, and this is perhaps the first. How would you advise Democrats to reframe beyond Dr. Weston? 
his comment, the, the lines that he used, and, and I don't want to get into it because I do not want to use a four-letter word on television, but the, line, the language that you used uh, in, the, in the troops is perfection. It's absolutely, it's 100%. I can see the dials going off in my head. I can see Republicans looking at it and saying that's brilliant. So that would be the first thing I do. Look, we talked about 2004. John Kerry, you're going to say this is so irrelevant and so superficial, but John Kerry never smiled during the 2004 campaign ever. His wife is worth a billion dollars. If my wife were that rich, I'd be high five in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is that Kerry looked just like the tree that threw apples at Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. We need, we need to be able to relate to these individuals. However, this is 2008, and I can promise you that intellectual curiosity and knowledge and wisdom is going to be so much more important in 2008 than it was in 2004 or 2000. That's going to be the important context of the campaign, and that helps some candidates and hurts others. Thank you. Or maybe it is you who's been telling Hillary to smile more. Uh, somebody <laughs> no, got the you know message. What they have to do one other thing. The Hillary laugh that you guys remember from about three or four weeks ago, of all the things that we've tested on her, that one tested the worst. Because what that said to viewers who saw it is that it is all manufactured. That someone told her, you get an embarrassing question, you laugh. Jon Stewart put all of those five shows together. We show that, and it's called, and you hate the phrase, it's called the Hillary cackle. We need genuine. We need honest. And that comes across as being dishonest. All right, uh, George, actually, this, you can pick up on this because the next one is for you. And by the way, history is being made here today because George and Frank are on stage for the first time ever. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, George, uh, in particular, but anyone can take this. Can you actually cite some examples of how and where Democrats have effectively reframed a Republican argument or slogan? Um, there have been a number. Uh, for example, uh, if you take the issue of occupation, uh, Jim Webb successfully used that in Virginia, where he talked about uh, he didn't use war and terror at all. He talked about uh, our occupation there and said you can't win an occupation, you can only withdraw, and he won in Virginia. Very, very clearly, that was, that was you know, a most obvious case. Uh, the um, cases uh, of um, the candidates in Montana who love the land, and they understood that Montanans love the land, but they would never call themselves environmentalists. They never used sustainability or any of those things. They talked about the land, they talked about water, they talked about cattle being poisoned, etc. They said it right. They addressed the people who, in their language, who shared their values, and they understood when they shared their values. They got it right. That, those are obvious examples. We can could, we could go into more. But I, I want to say something about trust, and I want to respond to George Soros's question this morning about whether people care about truth. And I think the answer is yes, but there's a very interesting Berkeley study that was done about 30 years ago on the understanding of the word lie. And a lie turns out to have three components. The question is, does somebody believe or not believe what they're saying? Are they trying to deceive you in some way that is either to harm them or help harm you or, or help themselves? And is it true? The least important is whether it's true in this. The most important is whether they're trying to deceive you and whether they, they, are understand, they believe what they're saying. That is what authenticity and trust are about. And that's what Worthland found out when he was working with Reagan, and that's what these candidates in the Republican Party understand. They try to project truth and authenticity. Truth is not a, an issue there. Now, people do because they, when they ask people in the same study, what is a lie? They say something that's not true. And there's a reason for that that I won't go into. It's a little more complicated, but and it's well understood why that's the case. But the point here is that they do care about truth, but the way they see truth is through authenticity uh, and trust. Okay, can, I, can I just answer, add a piece to something George said? Just one other example that comes to mind. It was not from a campaign. It was Al, Al Gore in an inconvenient truth versus Al Gore in his inconvenient campaign. 
Um, <laughs> And we have a lot of great one-liners on this panel. <laughs> but but, but I, no, I just, I, there's a specific example I just wanted to get. I'll make it very quick. It was, it was at the end of the film when instead of talking about, you know, global warming as a serious crisis, blah, blah, the way that Democrats normally, normally talk about it, 